And now we will uh, we will go to our midrash, which I'm sure you're all waiting very uh, impatiently as we continue our reading of the letter that a writer, maybe Paul, maybe his cousin, I don't know, wrote as an for encouragement to the Messianic community, to the first century community of Israel. Abba Father be with us as we go through these words. Shem Yishu Mashiach. So, <clears throat> we've been reading the letter that was sent by very possibly Paul as an encouragement pep talk to the troubled Israeli messianic community. The community faces persecution from all sides, from their brethren and from the Romans. They lost all rights, even within their own country. What has become of their lives remind them what Yeshua, that Yeshua had not promised them sunshine without rain. They are poor and they fear gathering together. They remember the master's word, in the world you shall have tribulation. As one of the only promise he made concerning their lives in this world, in their own country. There is one bright spot though, in the fruits of these economic hardships, social isolation, and governmental restrictions, restrictions and persecution, using his own persecuted life, Paul the Apostle exhorts communities everywhere with the words, we rejoice in our suffering, it's in Romans 5, 3 through 5. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given us. So basically, suffering, if we simplify the equation, suffering brings hope. And hope is the proof. Hope, in spite of all that, is the proof and testimony that God's love has been put into our hearts through the Spirit. I like to reverse that. If we lose hope, there's no God's love. The hope that we obtain through suffering is a proof that God's love has been poured into our heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I'll, re I'll read it again, Romans 5, 3 through 5. I'm not saying this, I, Paul. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The writer of the letter to the first century Israeli Messianic community wants to encourage and lift them up from the lift them out from the morass of the fatalistic discouragement that threatens to destroy it. He reaches deep into their Jewish souls. He tells them that their present mission is greater than that of their patriarchs and fathers. He tells them that their faith should stand strong, that Abraham and David are watching them, cheering them on from the grandstands. He assures them that the prophets of old have all desired to see what they see. He then tells them that Yeshua is greater than angels, than Moshe, or than any high priest, and that therefore, knowing that their ship is stirred by such great captain, they should not fear. After finishing his explanation concerning the high priesthood of Yeshua, according to the order of Melchizedek, he now wants to make a point, 
concerning Hashem's covenant with his people. So I want to right now make a little break and tell you that what's going to come now uh, might not make sense unless you've listened to the previous teachings. I mean, it's one letter and so every, every, uh, every segment builds on the former one. So, and uh, if you're interested in listening to it, you can go to my, um, we can write to us through, through the comments and ask for it. You can go also to my Rabbi Gabriel uh, Lombroso YouTube page. It's there. Patreon. And also on Patreon, Rabbi Lombroso Patreon. It's there. <clears throat> I'm going to have some water. <clears throat> now we will start <clears throat> with Hebrews 8.1. Now the point that we are saying in this, this being the two former chapters and even three previous chapters, where the writer explains Yeshua's position as a priest by using the Melchizedek event with Abraham, as well as the words concerning Melchizedek spoken of, prophesied by David. So this is what this means. The point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Wow. One who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. A minister in the holy places, in the true tent, the true tabernacle. That the Lord set up, not man. Beautiful. So again, now the, the writer is going to start doing comparisons. You know, if this is so, wow, how much more? This is what he's been doing since Hebrews 1, right? This is, this is what we've been talking about. So he, he says that the Levitical priests, as we talked about, they serve below, in the temple below. When the writer wrote this letter, the temple was most likely still standing. It was destroyed maybe two, three years later. So he says that the Levitical priest serves below, but the high priest we serve serves above. Hebrew, Hebrews 8.3 For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for the priest also to have something to offer. He's talking now about the Levitical priest, okay? This is a the priest that come, they're appointed to offer offerings of the people, but they also have to do for themselves. That's something we talked about in the previous segment. 8.4. Now, if Yeshua were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. What? If Yeshua were on earth, he couldn't be a Levitical priest. He's not a descendant of Aaron. He's a descendant of Judah. Aaron was a descendant of Levi. So it says here, if Yeshua were on earth, he could not be a priest at all. He would not be a Levitical priest. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the Torah, according to the Torah of Moshe, the priests who offer gifts are the Levitical priests. Yeshua doesn't go. It has to be the sons of Aaron, and Yeshua is not. He is a far away removed cousin, but he's not a descendant of Aaron. 8 5. They, the Levitical priests, serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Here's what guy is saying here, Hebrews 8.5. They, the Levitical priest, 
They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly thing. What he said here is simple. The priesthood of Yeshua serves above. The priesthood of Levi serves below and serves as an illustration of the one above. We can't see the one above. We have no clue. It's somewhere in a dimension that where we have no access right now. But if we want to know what it looks like, we see the one below. The one below is like a model. Like, you know, you've been little airplane, model airplanes or ships. I have one in my office to build it's a Star Trek Enterprise model. I haven't done it yet. But uh, uh, the one below serves as a model of the one above. So you might say, well, hey, come on, it's far-fetched. Well, again, our writer is very faithful and he's going to give, a, give us a proof text of what he's saying. Now, the proof text is the next verse. It's the same verse, actually. For when Moshe was about to erect the tent, the tabernacle, he was instructed by God, saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. That's in Exodus 25, 40. So here, what, what Exodus 25, 40, God tells him, you know, you're going to make this and this and this and that, okay. And actually, God showed it to him. He says, see that you make everything according to the pattern that I've shown you on the mountain. So, so Moshe went, he went by a model that he saw. So it makes sense then that what, what he built, which was really the system of the Levitical priesthood, he, he built according to what he saw above. So the writer here, he says, yeah, the Levitical priesthood below is, is a model of what's above. It's very simple, really. It's really simple. 8.6. But as it is, Messiah has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old. So he says the old because uh, the ministry of Yeshua, even the ministry of Yeshua seems to have really, really, really began. 2,000 years ago. And I don't want to get into details about that. I want to stay with our text. It sits again. As it is, Messiah has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old. You see, again, he makes a comparison. There's a ministry, but Yeshua's ministry is much more. As the covenant he mediates, the covenant he mediates, okay, is better since it is an added on better promises. And to understand what that means, we've got to go back to the text we read last week, um, that uh, the promises of the tabernacle of David, uh, the promises is the promises that God has made through David. So, and if you want to understand that, you have to go back to that text. I don't want to re-explain it now. So now that we've read this, I'm going to reread 6 again. And then I want you to brace yourself for another excellent piece of Jewish Midrash. So 8.6. But as it is, Messiah has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old. As the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. Actually, for, for, for beginning from 8-7, if you have a King James Bible, eventually it would be really good for you to take it. A good edition of the King James Bible, not a Gideon's edition. There is some stuff that is not said there. But uh, Zondervan or Nelson or Cambridge or something like that. Uh, because you've got to be able to see something in there. So, uh, maybe you'll do it later, but if you do have a King James Version, it will be really nice for you to take it. And I will start now with 8.7, where it says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasions to look for a second. 
that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. So, first of all, he's saying it's written there that the covenant was faultless, that it was not faultless. But if you have this King James edition, I want you to notice something. The word covenant is italicized. And uh, that's very important. You see, the King James Version of the Bible was actually very faithful to, to take notes of certain Hebrew and Greek things. For example, in the Old Testament, where, wherever you have the word is, am, or are, the verb to be in the present tense, those words are italicized. Why? Because it had to be added in English, whereas Hebrew does not use anything to say the verb to be in, in the present tense. It has for the past and future, but not present tense. It's inferred. So in English, it had to be added. Uh, Hebrew does not have indefinite article A or N. So again, you'll find in the King James Bible that A or N in the Hebrew, not, not the New Testament Greek, the Tanakh, A or N is italicized because it had to be added by the English writers, you know, to, to make sense of the English text. It's not messing with the word, you know, you mess with the word only if you add something in Hebrew. English is a translation, you know, so. So, um, so here, the word covenant was not even in the Greek because this, the original text of Hebrew, we only have it in Greek. It was written in Hebrew, but it hasn't been found yet. You know, it's not because we don't have it that it doesn't exist or it's been destroyed. It's just we haven't found it yet. Hashem is able to preserve his word. You know, so, so here, uh, the word, uh, in, even in the Greek text of the, of the letter to the Hebrews, the word covenant does not exist, and you can, you 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 can uh, look at it yourself. So he says, if that first mm -mm -mm had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Eight eight. For he finds fault with them when he says. So, he didn't say he finds fault with, in the former verse, the word covenant is added. But, but there, the then doesn't refer to covenant either, because there's no covenant, really. The word is added, you remember? So, he finds fault with them. Well, who does he find fault with? He cannot find fault with his word, cannot find fault with the Torah. The Torah is perfect. David says in Psalm 19. He found fault with the people because the people themselves broke the covenant. Okay, the people themselves are the ones who break the covenant. What's the problem? The covenant is us because we're not able to keep it. So there he, he's going to quote a whole section from Jeremiah 33. He says, he find fault with them when he says, and now we'll start from Jeremiah, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. We will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like a covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue my covenant, and so I, sh I showed that I so I showed no concern for them, declare the Lord. The word covenant there in your text in Hebrew is not italicized. This is a straight quotation from Jeremiah. So I'll read it again. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with the fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. What, what he refers now is 
gotten in the covenant, and then they went straight to the golden calf. The covenant, the first one that Hashem made with the people at Mount Horeb, was built on the premise of the people's obedience. Their disobedience, therefore, broke their contract with God. The contract was broken because the contract was based, it means it was only valid as long as they obey. It was now broken. According to the text in Exodus, we know that Moshe went back up the mountain to renew the contract that was made before, and that that new contract though retaining the same teachings and commands, same text, was, not, but was now based on, based on Hashem's mercy and their disobedience, Hashem's mercy and their disobedience being covered by the virtue of one who had favor, favor with God. In this case, it was Moshe. You can read the text yourself. In Exodus 32 through 34. So that is very important. That's what he's, that is what he's talking about. My, my, my Torah they didn't keep, my covenant they broke. You know, that's what he said. So I didn't care for them. You know. I'll start again from 8.8. 8. For he finds fault with them when he says... Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. And now he's going to describe the covenant he's going to make, the new covenant, the new covenant made on new premises. And we're continuing with Jeremiah, which the writer of the letter to Hebrews quotes. 8.10 For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. We're talking about after those days, okay, after those days. Well, Jeremiah just finished a prophecy talking about Jerusalem's punishment. So basically, after those days, I mean after the Babylonian exile. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, after the Babylonian exile, which ended up in the 4th, 5th century BC. I will put my Torah into their minds and write, it, write them on their heart, write the commandment on their hearts. So he's going to put the Torah, you know the Torah that was given in Mount Sinai? You know, not killing, about the offering, about observing the Shabbat, about eating kosher, about circumcision. You know, this is the Torah he's going to put our mind, because there's no other Torah, there's only one, it's his Torah. He's going to put it in our mind, and write it on our heart, and I will be their God, they shall be my people. That's a, a repeat. That's a repeat from what Hashem had told Moshe already. You know, if you obey my commandment, you'll be my people. But now he says, well, what's going to make you my people? I'm going to write my commandments in your heart. It's going to be easier for everybody. And they shall not teach each one his brother and each one his his neighbor and each one his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. So this covenant is not yet happened because as far as I know today, not everybody knows the Lord. And there is a need to go tell my neighbor and my brother about the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the last one of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. So this is beautiful. There's more to the text, but I want to stop here. But this is what uh, we have in, there's more to the promise in Jeremiah, to the, uh, to the idea, to the whole concept of the New Testament. There is more things, but the, 
Hebrew stops here. So, so, um, so, so, so here we see a contract which is not based on our obedience this time. The new covenant is not based on our obedience, but it's based on Hashem changing our hearts with His mercy, just like the second one that Moshe brokered with Hashem on Mount Horeb. And if you want to see how that happened, Moshe bargained with God to not destroy Israel and, and uh, Hashem accepted for no other reason that he is the merciful and compassionate God. The word of this new covenant, the description, the properties, attributes, the explanation of what this new covenant is all about comes straight from the prophecy in Jeremiah 33. Let's continue, Hebrews 8, 13. Now, our writer is going to explain what he means when he brings all that up. In speaking of a new covenant, uh-oh, if you have a King James Bible, the word covenant is italicized. Could have been added. In speaking of a new covenant, Hebrew 8.13, he makes the first one obsolete. What? And what has become obsolete and grows old is ready to vanish away. Ooh, this verse is often used to say, you see, you see, here, the Torah is obsolete, it's ready to vanish away. You see, I told you. Anybody, anybody has ever bring you that verse to tell you that? You know, so he says, and I read it again, Hebrews 8.13. It's speaking of a new covenant, the word covenant italicized. He makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. But what have we just learned? We learned that what was what vanished away, what was taken away before was not the Torah itself, not the commandments. It was the premise on which the contracts for example, Mrs. Ambrosio and I, we have an apartment downstairs that we rent. And we have certain rules uh, that if our renter obeys, we have no right to kick them out. If we say no dog bigger than three inches or no fish bigger than a yard, or no or no smoking. If that person breaks that contract, we have the right, the legal right to say, sorry, you broke the contract, we're done. But let's say our renter starts having a zoo downstairs, and we don't want that. The, our renter has elephants, zebras, and giraffes. It can make a mess of the place. So he says, well, we want to kick you out. But we are merciful. We will we want to make sure to help you not to break the contract. So what can we do? You like animals? Okay, I'll give you a video of animals so you can watch them whenever you want from the TV. Does that work? Okay. So because of my love and mercy and compassion, we will allow you to stay. And this time. I will not put the clause in your contract that if you disobey, you will get kicked out. I will take that clause away. What I'm going to do instead is help you obey. Okay? So what, and, and then I will resign that contract with the same rules. The rules of the contracts have not changed. What changes is the premise on which the contract stands. And I will re-sign that contract in order to, to, to and help the person do it. And the clause that if they disobey, they get kicked out, will take it, be taken away. 
because they will be staying there, not because they obey, but because I said they can. That's what was taken away. That's the part of the covenant that was taken away. When Moshe came back, he came back with the Torah. It was the same Torah, the same commandments, but this time based on the premises of God's mercy. You see, and people say that the Torah is about law and not grace. You're kidding me? That in itself was a prime example of what Yeshua did for us. Okay, uh, so we'll get back to our text. And, and, we, and of course we cannot, this is the end of chapter 8, but we're in the middle of a, of a big thing. We can't stop here. So, sorry, we're going to have to chapter, we're going to have to go to chapter 9. And chapter 9, so if you remember that last verse of chapter 8, the word covenant did not exist. Okay? That would come. You got to read that without the word covenant. You got to remember. And the original letter didn't have chapter and verse. Okay, it's one letter, which I could redivide the whole thing. You know, it's like, but uh, uh, it was one letter. So he's continuing that argument from Hebrews eight thirteen and to, into where the word covenant was actually added and did not exist in the text. And in nine one, he says, now even the first covenant covenant italicized had regulation for worship and an earthly place of holiness so everybody thinks yeah he's talking about the Torah you know but, but wait a minute and I'm gonna bug you with a little bit of grammar those of you who've taken my Hebrew class must go oh no I thought I was done with that in the sentence first covenant the noun is, yes, right, covenant. First is therefore an, yes, an adjective. An adjective that describes the noun covenant, right, in the first covenant. But let's take the word covenant out. That, that there's a big change because that word has been added. There's a big change, you know. If the word covenant is taken away, then first becomes a noun. In grammar, it's called actually a substantial adjective. But a substantial adjective is an adjective that becomes a noun. So an example of that is when we call the almighty. It's an adjective that becomes a noun. The most high, it's an adjective that becomes a noun. Same thing. The first, the first becomes a noun. So we'll read the verse 9 again. Remember from 8, 13 and 9, the word covenant was added. You see it, it's italicized. In 9, 1 it says, now even the first had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. What's he talking about? Well, let's keep reading. That's what I like about the Bible. It gives you all the answers. There's no need to guess. 9, 2. For a tent was prepared. You see, he's explaining the first that, uh, uh, things of worship and everything. For he says, for a tent was prepared. The first section, oh, here we have our first here. The, the Greek actually uses the word protos, protos, which is a Greek noun meaning first. I think the Greek adjective for first as an adjective would be a different word. So maybe it would be primos or something. So. For a tent was prepared, the first section, the protos, again relating to 9 1, in which were the lampstand and the table of the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. What's he talking about? He's talking about the protos, the first chamber of the tabernacle. He's describing it. He's not talking about covenant. Why was that word added? I think the person who did the translation did not exactly understand what was going on. I don't think there's anything malicious in it. I think. Everybody can make mistakes, you know, but at least in the King James, they wrote the words that they, they italicized the word they added. So actually that gives us a little bit of a clue to choose, you know, and we should, you know. So it says, for a tent was prepared, the first section, that's your first, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of presence, it's called the holy place. He's talking about uh, the first chamber of the tabernacle. <laughs> behind the second curtain, so 
you know, there was a, the way the tabernacle was done, there was a curtain, the first chamber, and a second curtain. So he's talking, behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place. Having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, with gold, and in which was a golden urn, urn um, holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded at the tablets of the covenant. It's not talking about covenant. He is describing the tabernacle that was built during the that we see in the book of Exodus. So, as you can see, this adding of the word covenant totally changed the meaning of the text. It continues with his description of the Ark, 9.5. Above it uh, were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail, and we will not. I want to keep my, my track of See, he was doing the same thing. I don't want to get distracted with talking about that. We're going to keep, I'm going to keep on track. So uh, now he's, he's, he's going to speak of the function of the priest within that tabernacle. The guy is really thorough and he knows what he's talking about. 9.6, these preparations having first been made, the tabernacle being built, everything that according to the way God showed Moshe on the mount, the priests go regularly into the first section in what's called the holy, right? They go regularly in the first section performing their ritual duties. Ritual duties that have to do, uh, that, uh, the, the tar that were in concerns with the Levitical service of offerings. The Levitical serving service of offering only had, only came to the first chamber. Verse 7, but into the second, only the high priest goes. And he goes but once a year at Yom Kippur. We've been reading a lot about Yom Kippur in the last two parashas. And he doesn't come without blood, which he offers for himself and for the un unintentional sins of the people. So he comes on Yom Kippur to offer blood for himself because he's a mortal priest. He has, he's a, himself a sinner, a human. He has to offer something for himself, right? Again, we talked about that in the previous sessions. And for the unintentional sins of the people, I'd like you to just pay attention to that word unintentional. And again, we're not going to talk about it, but it's there. So, you followed everything so far? He's talking about the tabernacle. So now he's going to grace us with explaining what does all this mean. And, and, you know, many people have speculated as to the meaning of these two chambers. Of course, when we're not told something, hey, it's all open for explanation. You know, anybody can have a jab at it. It's okay. But... This writer is not going to say, you know what I think this means? You know what, what I think God's trying to show us with that? You know, I had a dream last night, and, and you know, I had a vision the other day, and I'm thinking that maybe, you know, whoa, 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 I'm sure I have feeling in my heart. No, he's not saying all that. The way he's putting it in Hebrews 9.8 is, by this, this being the tabernacle he just described, and the functions and all that, his description starting from the beginning of chapter 9. By this, and I would say even from before, right? By this, the Holy Spirit indicates. So he's not saying, I think. He's not saying, I believe. The word indicates has the same root as the word in English, index. The index shows the way. You could, and, and uh, you could look at it in Greek, you could check, you could say, by this, the Holy Spirit shows us, points to, index, indicate. 
By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place, and he's talking of the most holy, is, 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 is not yet opened as long as the first section, section is still standing. And you might say, well, you added the word, you, 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 you might say that, I say that it's the, the way to the holy place when before it says that the whole, the, the second section is called most holy. But just because of what he says afterward, as long as the first section, the way is not open to the other one. And then he's going to describe, he's going to give us the key to understand what he's saying. Are you ready for it? I'm going to start from eight again. By this, the tabernacle and its priestly functions, the Holy Spirit indicates, points to, tells us, not him, the Holy Spirit, that the way into the holy place, the most holy, is not yet open as long as the first section is still standing. And then there is a parenthesis, which is symbolic for the present, present age. Wow. The first section is symbolic of the present age. Our times, which are the same as the times of the writer. Our time. He says, the next section then, by logical deduction, is the age, the world to come. You know, as long as this one is standing, the entrance in the world to come is not yet open. This is why when we, I talked about the, the prophecy in Jeremiah, I was pointing out that the time of the new, the renewed covenant, it was a time when everybody would know their brother. Everybody would know the Lord. A time when there was no need for one to tell his neighbor, his brother, about the Lord, because the Torah was in our heart. Which doesn't sound like right now. But we're, the, we're in the age of the first, the first section. He says, I'm not saying it, it's written. 9, 8 and 9. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet open as long as the first, first section is still standing, which is symbolic of the present age. According to this arrangement, he continues, gifts and offerings and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. So again, the first section is a section of gifts and blah, blah, blah. It cannot, like we talked about last time, the Torah, the, the Levitical offerings were never made to, to clean our conscience. It's a, that's not what we use for that. It's try, like trying to use pliers to put a nail in the wall. Wrong too. The Levitical offering had nothing to do with cleaning the conscience. He says, according to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drinks and various washings emotions, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. So he's talking that these things are imposed upon us until the time, the end of that era, of this age. We're just going to continue the way he's saying. The reformation he's talking about is not Martin Luther's reformation. He's talking uh, reformation when this age will pass. The Reformation really is represented by the sec entrance in the second chamber, where only the high priest goes once a year. And he has to do it every year again. And every year this high priest has to offer something for himself and for the people. Now I will return to reading from the ESV. Hebrews 9.11. But when Messiah, so he, he, you see, he was saying there is a, at first, I just want you to understand how the text is built. At first, he was describing the covenant, says there is that first chamber when uh, we do the priests come. And, and then there was a second chamber where the 
high priest comes once a year and then he goes back to the first chamber and he explains what's going on in the first chamber and what it means and now he's going to go back to the second chamber and chamber and explain he says but when messiah appears 9 11 as a high priest we talked about that title before in the two previous lessons when messiah appears as a high priest of the good things that have come then through the greater and more perfect tent not made with hand that is not of this creation i.e the tabernacle from above he entered once for all into the holy places just like the high priest enters one once a year into the holy of holy but Yeshua did not enter by the means of blood, goats, and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. Then he's taking that whole thing, brings Yeshua into the mix and says, look, this high priest, he can only do so much for you once a year. Well, you have a high priest who entered the second chamber, not of the tabernacle below, but the second chamber of the tabernacle above, with his own blood. That's what he did. And therefore... Uh, he entered, so 9-12, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by the means of the blood of goats and calves, of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. He doesn't need to do it again next year, like the high priest below. I hope you understand what I, where, where, where this is taking us. And again, he's going to give a proof text. that The writer is a great lawyer. You know, he's going to give precedent, proof text, like in court, you know. 9.13, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of, an, of a heifer sanctify for the purification of flesh, these things, the blood of goats and heifer and all that, those were only for the in view of ceremonial purity, so you can enter the temple, the, the precincts of the temple. So if these can do that, because that's all they were for. They were never for the conscience we talked about last week. You know, so it says, if the blood of these animals, they can make you ceremonially fit to enter the house of God, physical, physically, 9.14, how much more? Here is your Hebrew text. It's all the time if this, how much more that, you know? How much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God? He said, the, the high priest, he has to do it again. He doesn't have an eternal spirit, but our Messiah does. You know, how much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from the dead work, from dead works to serve the living God. I'll read it again. How much more? If the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defied persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You know, this is uh, the whole idea here. This is the whole idea. So I want to go into that dead work thing, you know, because that's a really important thing. Usually in Christianity, when people read that, it says, yeah, yeah, Messiah purifies us from having to do the dead works, you know, i.e. dead works, you know, eat kosher, for, do Shabbat, circumcision. But dead works, that's a Torah thing of Moshe. You know, I'm saying Moses. Dead works. But, but, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. Dead works. We cannot interpret what is dead work according to 21st century Protestant theology. You know, dead works, we're going to apply the word dead works in the mouth of the guy who spoke it. In John, 1st John 3, 4, we're told that sin is the breaking of the Torah. Some Bibles will say Torah, some Bibles will say commandments, some Bibles will say the law, but it all refers to the Moses thing. There's no other. 
It says, sin is the breaking of the Torah. And then Paul in, uh, in uh, Romans 6, 23 says that the wages of sin is death. So we put the two together. The breaking of the Torah means death. So, because, and then it says that the commandment is life. So it cannot be the commandment that is dead law, dead works. It's not, it cannot be to obey the commandment that, dead, that is dead works. Actually, dead works are any, is anything that goes against the commandment. Selfishness, pride, arrogance, murder, jealousy, holding grudges. All those are dead works. So, so it, it, it's really important. So I, I read it again. How much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And now he's going to give the conclusion to his whole thing, why he started this conversation about the covenant at the end of chapter 8. He says, therefore, conclusion, verse 15, he, Yeshua, is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promise inherit, eternal inheritance since, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgression committed under the first covenant. Death means shedding of blood. There is no signature of covenant without shedding of blood. Today we only shed ink, thank God. A covenant by a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater, you know, the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. So again, what the point he's giving here is that, hey, you know, the covenant that we're under is actually, we were under the shadow of it. Now we're in the real thing, guys. Don't flub it. You know, don't mess it up. You know, this is the real thing. This is, this is a real game. It's not practice anymore. This is it. Don't flub it. And these words are spoken to us today also. And this should tell us about the importance for us not to flub it. Okay. <laughs>